Okay, hi, welcome to the January 23rd, 2023 City Council meeting. February, it's not January. <laughs> oh, I wrote the date wrong earlier, okay. Anyways, <laughs> welcome, it's February. So, may we please have a roll call? Here. 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 And let's join in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Do we have any additions or deletions? Thank you. And we'll move on to presentations. This um, is going to be done by Jessica Kahn. Thank you. All right, good evening, Mayor and Council members. This evening, I am happy to introduce two new faces to Public Works. Um, our first new face to Public Works is not a new face to the city. Uh, Shalon Bennett is our new development services technician. Unfortunately, she couldn't be here this evening, but if you've ever been direct, she was the first person at the door, and now you come to Public Works, and she is the first person at the door. So if you call <laughs> over, it will be Shalon, uh, to a very, very busy department this year, has jumped right in, and has been excellent, and we are so very happy to have her. Um, our second new face uh, to the Public Works Department is Erica Sinek. She just started on Tuesday, so she is brand, brand new as our environmental projects manager. Erica is a Minnesota native. Uh, she has a BS in fisheries and wildlife from the University of Minnesota and a master's in science in applied marine and watershed science from CSUMB. Um, Erica brings to the city a decade of environmental science experience inclusive of Research measuring the impacts of visitor disturbance on marine birds and mammals and pollutants, and quantifying microplastics and waters discharging into the Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary. Erica also has ex experience serving as an environmental consultant in the general Monterey Bay region. Um, in addition to the hard scientists, sciences, Erica has a passion for public education outreach with the goal of inspiring environmental stewardship in our surrounding communities, which I think is going to be such a great asset to the city of Capitola. Uh, lastly, Erica is an avid sports enthusiast and baker, which will be a great benefit to us here at City Hall. <laughs> <laughs> and so I would all, oh, 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 sorry, I thought you were behind me. Um, I would like you all to welcome Erica. Hi, Erica. Hi. Yeah, come on up. Hi everybody, thank you for having me. Um, yeah, I just wanted to formally introduce myself. My name's Erica Senek, and very excited to be taking on this role and look forward to meeting all of you one-on-one -on -one in person later. Great, thank you, Erica, welcome. Should we tell her now, Mayor, that we're both gluten-free? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well. get the almond flour ready. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and the next presentation? We've got the Soco Creek Water District. Good evening, Mayor and Council members. Uh, Melanie Mal Schumacher, myself, Ron Duncan, Soco Creek Water District. Thank you for having us tonight. Um, you know, we're so fortunate to live in such a small town. We love Capitola. Your staff is excellent. And because it is a small town, we have uh, one more piece of confirmation to Erica's impressive resume here. We have tasted her uh, wedding cake before. Ooh. Her friend. So it's true, uh, okay. she is a good baker. <laughs> so we have some slides for you tonight. Next slide, please. Uh, and we're gonna just touch on three things. Really, uh, we want, we're here to give you kind of just a big update uh, and to tell you a little bit about what's going on at Soquel Creek and we'll touch on these three items. So with that next uh, slide, we always start with the why. Why are we doing what we do? Besides providing, you know, just water day in, day out to the uh, Capitola citizens and beyond, uh, we also have a, a kind of a flag and a cause we're up against and that's seawater intrusion. It's been threatening our water supply for years. You can see this map here of Monterey Bay, the red, show seawater intrusion in almost the Salinas down in the Monterey area, uh, Watsonville three miles in. And then when we get to Capitola in the bend there, 
it's right at the shoreline, right? And so it will decimate our wells if we haven't taken action and take more action. So that's the, that's the kind of battle we're up against. And Melanie's gonna present a little bit about the solution. Sure, thank you. Um, it's great to come back to Capitola periodically to give updates on Pure Water SoCal. Next slide. Um, we've been coming, I think, for a number of years now to kind of get, walk through the evaluation and feasibility stage as we were going through design and permitting, and now we actually are in active construction. So we love it that um, Jamie allows us to come and share a couple minutes with you. Really, the Pure Water SoCal project is a recycled water project that's taking about 25% of the wastewater that is discharged to the Monterey Bay Ocean and purifying that and then putting that water into the ground to protect against seawater intrusion and raise groundwater protective levels. The basin here is one of 21 basins in California that is critically overdrafted and we do have that mandate to bring the basin back into sustainability. So this is a, a general overview of the project. It is quite a, a, a robust program that includes three primary pieces. It's got treatment facilities um, that are located in the stars. We've got a tertiary treatment facility down at the Santa Cruz Wastewater Treatment Plant. We have our Fuller Water Purification Center at Chanticleer, which is midway in that second star, which is in the Live Oak community, right next to Staples and Long Marine, I mean, sorry, Staples and West Marine. And then we have about eight miles of pipeline that goes through city of Santa Cruz, the unincorporated areas of the county and city of Capitola that's conveying water from the, the treatment plants and then out into the wells. And then uh, that eight miles is four miles from the wastewater treatment plant to the purification center, and then four miles from the purification center out to our three seawater intrusion prevention wells. We have one well in Capitola on Monterey by New Brighton Middle School. And then we have a well um, on Willowbrook Lane which is by the Cabrillo uh, Fitness and the Montessori, and then a well at Twin Lakes Church. So those are three strategically placed wells that will help um, recharge the basin. Um, the project right now is sized to produce 1.3 million gallons a day of purified water, which accounts for about 30% of SoCal Creek Water District's needs to replenish and then for future um, planned growth. And, but the plant can also be expanded to double capacity in the future if needed for more basin sustainability or for other needs by regional partners. Next slide. Um, the project, uh, it can't be done you know, in a box or in a silo. We definitely have relied upon partnerships with other agencies listed here, including the city of Capitola. Uh, very thankful for these kinds of partnerships and collaboration. Um, and also very thankful of the funding that we've received. So we're very fortunate to have um, outside funding both in grants and low interest loans from the state and federal agencies. Next slide. Just a snapshot, you know, I think right now the heart and where kind of the magic is happening in Pure Water Soquel is at that water purification facility. That's an artistic rendering you see on the left that was generated that shows that the facility um, is gonna be located right there. Um, off of the freeway. Um, the picture on the right was when we did groundbreaking um, in 2021. Um, I think Mayor Brooks thank you, was, was the mayor at the time and came. Um, and then the picture on the bottom is just from this last month where we, tour, we do tours. Um, that was a, a group from Scotts Valley Water District. So we welcome tours uh, right now during the construction phase if anybody here uh, from the city of Capitola is interested in it, so just let staff know and we can arrange that. Uh, we do hope that the facility will come on in, in 2024. Uh, one of the last things um, before I go back to Ron is just to kind of highlight, we're really proud of the opportunity that Pure Water SoCal has been able to be kind of a showcase project in California. Um, just last year, we were actually recognized in a film series put on by the International Water Association called Beneath the S a Series. It, we were one of 16 projects around the world um, that was showcased in this online platform. So we're really excited about that. And it has a lot of footage of Capitola in that video. Which is <clears throat> Thank you, Melanie. So the next slide. Uh, a couple of things you may be interested in. We have uh, since 2003 a water demand offset program. That means if you build in our SoCal Creek water area, 
uh, you had to offset that demand. In reality, in recent years, what that meant, if you built a single family home, it cost you about $20,000 for those offsets. The, the board voted last week or the week before to sunset that program, so it is now terminated. So I wanted to make sure you were informed of that. Um, it's been a bridge to help us stave off uh, seawater intrusion until we got to a project and the board feels confident enough uh, that we're there now with Pure Water SoCal. Next slide, please. So just touching on our core competencies, this is what we do to provide you and your customers water. And please call us if, if we can be of service. Just a slide there. And just the closer, next slide, just again, thank you all so much for allowing us to come. We wanted to try to give you a minute back of your time because we know how it is uh, hearing all these presentations and everything. So thank you so much. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much. Does anybody have any questions? I, I actually do have a question. Yeah. Because I have to put them on the spot. Mm -hmm. um, can you give us an update on the rate increases that are occurring for our consumers here in, in Capitola? Sure, great, great question, good timing. So <clears throat> we are, I think coming out maybe in a couple of days, uh, having a water rate advisory committee. We're trying to form that with uh, customers in our area. So we'll be announcing that in a newsletter. We were just doing the proof of it. In other ways, we're gonna communicate that out. That process starts probably in April and we're looking for people, so please send them our way if you, if you customers who are interested. And then we'll probably go through about an eight month long process, six month long process uh, with a rate consultant, with uh, customers. We're trying to get different perspectives in there. We believe that helps the end result. And then from that, uh, we'll go through all the analysis and implement a new rate structure. We're looking to do a four year, uh, structure over four years and it would kick off in january of next year that's that's the desire what those numbers are i i we have no idea at this point we're looking the boards look you know we'll take the input and go forth so yeah thank you any other questions anybody else no all right thank okay, you so thank much you. thank you for presenting And do we have a report on closed session? <laughs> Good evening. We had a closed session on the items on the agenda and no reportable action was taken. Thank you. Thank you. Any additional materials? Thank you. So we can move on to oral communications um, for mem from members of the public. Um, this could be on any consent items or any items that are not on tonight's agenda. Seeing no one in the house, do we have anybody online? Judy Kessler, please unmute yourself and you'll be able to speak. Okay, great. Um, hi, my name is Judy Kessler, and I wanted to talk about an incident that occurred in Capitola last night. Um, my daughter was just hired a few days ago at Capitola Bar and Grill, and she was excited to work there. But last night she waited on a table and she asked some customers for ID. And um, then she served one of the two customers a beer when she came back to the table, four Capitol police officers had surrounded the table and they asked who served the beer. And then they took a picture of my daughter and the customer. Um, and I understand that this is, you know, this is state law, I understand the principle of checking IDs and alcohol, but however, the fact that this happened in a restaurant that is one of the few that's currently open in Capitola after the storms and the damage. Um, and it's very busy due to their good fortune of being open. Um, they've had to hire new staff and it's been difficult for them to get trained properly. And also the fact that four police officers surrounded the table, it was very excessive in my opinion and intimidating for my daughter. And I think that this restaurant should be given a chance to 
you know, have a warning and time to properly train their staff instead of being punished. That's what I have to say. Thank you, Mrs. Kessler. Is there anybody else online? Okay. Any um, city council comments? Um, I would just like to say that on Sunday, we had our second beach cleanup um, since the storms, and it was a huge turnout. Um, big thanks to Jerry Jensen and um, the uh, recreation department, and um, there was a few local businesses, Trader Joe's, uh, Cast. Castanola Deli brought some coffee, Home Depot and Osh, um, and a lot of um, really happy people came out to clear the beach. The beach looks amazing and it was a beautiful day and it just was like a really great experience to be a part of and see everybody out, um, even in the wake of the things that have happened. So I just wanted to say what a great day it was and go check out the beach and see our hard work. Thank you. Do we have any Staff comments. We do have one update here from Mrs. Miller. Uh, good evening, Mayor, Council Members. Um, I am here with a um, staff comment that breaks from a little bit of normal tradition um, with just a few slides um, because a picture says more um, as a better comment. And so we'll just give it a minute. Okay, go ahead to the next one. So um, this past Saturday, we hosted the um, Beyond the Flood Benefits con benefit concert. Um, this was a true collaboration um, with city staff and many community members that all put together in what was actually three and a half weeks um, of time to put together a um, from noon to six benefit concert that um, hosted Jive Machine, at the Alex Susiro Band, and Joint Chiefs with Tony Lindsay. Um, we also had Sierra Nevada that provided a beer garden along collaboration with um, Mary Beth in order to provide the service. And we did merchandise sales and donation collections. Um, it was a very exciting event. And if you'll go ahead and move to the next slide, please. This is a quick thank you to all of the individuals that pulled together in order to make this happen. Um, there were lots of individuals within these organizations um, that made particular, put particular amount of energy into making things happen as well as some individuals not associated with any particular organization. Um, next slide, please. And we are proud to say that all of that work yielded $30,000 in um, funds raised specifically for the disaster um, relief. And that is the end of my comment. I'm happy to answer any questions if you have any. Thank you. Great news. That's amazing, yeah, look at that number. And thank you um, for all your hard work on that. I know it wasn't easy, um, and Chief Daly as well. So thank you for all the collaboration. And um, I wasn't able to attend, but I heard it was amazing. And I still need to get t-shirts, so we have more for sale. Okay. Yeah, um, I should comment that if anybody does want to buy um, some of the shirts, they are still available at the community center. Um, we are limited in larger sizes, but we have um, a, a smattering of adult sizes and youth sizes as well. Wonderful. Thank I'd like you. to say, Nikki, I saw a name on your slide, and again, it was Jerry Jensen, so thanks for all your hard work this weekend, Jerry. Right, uh, Supreme Bye. Volunteer. Yes, indeed. Yeah, thank you.
Thank you. Is that it for staff today? Okay, thank you. So we can move on to item eight, which is consent. Um, all the items under the consent, um, they'll be enacted by one motion in the form listed below. No separate discussion will be had. Um, is there any motion? I'll move approval of consent. Second it. Great. A motion and a second. May we have a roll call, please? Aye. 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 Thank you. All right. Uh, general government item 9A, wharf update, which has been a huge topic on everybody's minds. <laughs> Okay. Is my mic on? No. 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 Easy. Oh, yes, it's it is. It's just not very loud. Isn't there, you got to like hold All it right, right hold there. It close. Uh, so I'll kick this off on just sort of a quick update on where we stand with the state of emergency. Overall, the action tonight that we're recommending will be to actually terminate the state of emergency. Mm -hmm. But we also wanted to talk about kind of where we are overall and where we are with the wharf project as well. Okay. So next slide. We're, we're getting there. Oh, okay. <laughs> so I think more than anything else, uh, we have just the recap of how we got here, which everyone recalls that on January 5th, we were hit by a significant wave event. Uh, and there's the timeline for everybody to see. And then we uh, went through a series of vi visits from uh, all kinds of dignitaries. We organized a couple beach cleanups. We've had it hosted the Small Business Recovery Center. And then the benefit concert, which we just discussed, uh, took place last weekend as well. Slide, please. So then this is a quick summary of where we stand financially today. Uh, the total sort of estimated repair cost, this is a bigger number than you've seen <coughs> previously. We've now been incorporating in the permitting and design costs for each one of these projects. So the total damage estimate, we're now up to 3.5 million. Uh, and then our cost to date, we're at Depending on how you look at it, we've spent about $100,000 in direct sort of expenditures on material supplies and then the temporary repair to the Riverview pathway. And then we're $121,000 of staff time into the situation. So that's kind of a situation sort of update on where we stand fiscally. Uh, and now I think the kind of the main item we want to spend some time talking about this evening is the war, uh, because Jessica and her team have been able to really dig in and identify kind of a timeline and a plan to get the work done. So I'll turn it over to you. Good evening again, Mayor and Council members. As we all are very aware right now, um, during the January storms, the wharf uh, sustained some significant damage, uh, mostly uh, concentrated mid-span and then also at the head of the wharf near the two structures. Um, staff has been able to access uh, and visualize the damage to the wharf from the beach drone footage and some limited boat access. We did have one trip out to the wharf by boat with our design consultant who was able to produce this figure showing the specifics of the uh, wharf damage. Damage includes a demolished staircase, um, removal of handrail, decking, and eight piles that were dislodged. The estimated uh, cost of these damages are just north of $900,000. Um, the city had intended on bidding the wharf resiliency project later this year with an original start date of October 23 as uh, permitted by our coastal commission permit. Um, it is currently funded by $1.3 million in coastal conservancy funds. That's $600,000 down from the original $1.9 million grant. Those funds were used in phase one of the wharf project to uh, replace uh, pilings that needed to be repaired more immediately. Um, in December, the city was awarded $3.5 million in federal funding, and the remainder of the project was in city funds. Um, though our friends at FEMA have been out here quite a bit in the past month, the formal scoping project has just started as of uh, late last week. Um, we have them scheduled to come out for their first formal field visit to assess damage, all the dam storm damages to the city on March 15th. Um, so the city has two potential scenarios to uh, complete, repeat, complete the repairs caused by storm damage to the wharf. Uh, the first one would be to complete a standalone emergency repair project that would not include the deck expansion of the greater resiliency project. It would require additional permits and additional design uh, criteria. 
Uh, the timeline for a standalone project would have a start time of mid-May. As I said, the uh, FEMA process has just started and that's when we, the earliest day we would estimate having funding allocated to this project. Uh, a standalone project would require two months of lead time to acquire materials and then two months of construction, putting us at our earliest best case scenario completion date of a standalone project of mid-September of this year. Uh, the Wharf Resiliency Project would then begin several weeks later as originally planned in October of 2023. Uh, the cost for a standalone project would be $932,000 in construction repairs. There's an asterisk there because that was um, considering economies of scale of this be being completed with the same um, resiliency project. So uh, same, more of the same materials, less costs. So it's likely that would be a bit more than $900,000 in construction repairs. And then we know that there would be mobilization costs on a standalone project of approximately $200,000. The funding for a standalone project would be uh, um, qualify for FEMA funding. However, FEMA funding also requires a match of about 12% of city funds. Uh, the second scenario for the storm damage repairs is to complete it in tandem with the wharf resiliency project. So that would be the original project scope to widen the deck and enhance public access and complete the storm repair damage within the same project, which would be the same permitting and also limited uh, design alterations from our original project. A timeline for a combined project could start in summer of 2020, late summer of 2023 with an eight to nine month construction period. It's a little bit longer than just the resiliency project without the repairs. And then estimated completion date of spring of next year. The cost would be the $8 million of the original scope and the $900,000 in construction repairs. Uh, no additional, like I said, permitting or design, uh, minimal extra design work and no additional um, mobilization costs as there would only be the single mobilization cost for the single project. Uh, funding would still consist of the conservancy and local funding, uh, the FEMA funding, which we expect uh, in spring or summer of this year. And then the city would pursue expediting the federal funding allocated in December. Uh, the process for that funding being able for us to expend has not started at the federal level through this program yet. Based on previous fiscal year programs, we would expect through their normal process to have those funds allocated to us by fall of this year. So staff would pursue expediting that process. Staff intends on moving forward with the uh, scenario two based on a uh, project completion date. It would have us with a reopened wharf much sooner than doing two separate projects and cost savings. Um, it is eligible for a emergency standalone project it is eligible for FEMA funding, but at the end of the day with the mobilization and the design and the permitting costs would require approximately $200,000 in city funds above the cost of a combined project. Uh, staff realizes that might be alarming <laughs> to some of our constituents, um, that basically there will be a hole in the wharf until we can start this project in late summer. Uh, the city intends on putting out a public outreach campaign, which includes information on our website, social media, the city newsletter, and then on-site messaging. This is an example of some on-site messaging. Uh, this is from Avila Piers um, uh, Improvement Project from about a year ago. Um, I know it's a bit hard to read, but it has basically their milestones there on the top and a timeline on the bottom. Um, the timeline is pretty broad, um, so not to promise any specific dates, but then it also includes a QR code, which could link back to the city website. In this case, their QR code linked back to a funding campaign. Uh, staff has been in preliminary conversations with members of the community about a fundraising campaign for the wharf. Uh, proposing funding ancillary improvements, such as improved seating, lighting, um, visitor serving elements, such as uh, informational signage, all which would be enhancements to our plan public access project. Um, the Wharf Resiliency Project would still be the prior priority project. Fundraising could occur concurrently with the repair project, and ideally the whole project would be complete, the repairs, the initial our, um, initial resiliency project and all these public improvements uh, late next year. So the recommended action this evening is um, really just about the 
termination of the emergency, and the government code requires the council to actually terminate emergencies in these situations. So staff has determined that the flood conditions in the city have subsided, and termination of the emergency is warranted. So that takes us to the recommendation, and Jessica and I are available if you have any questions. Thank you. Anybody have questions? Yes, go for it. I have five questions, five questions. Jessica. <laughs> Second, and I am... I don't apologize, though, for, <laughs> for my questions. Um, for scenario two, the one we're going to be moving forward with, why are we waiting longer to start that project um, than in the scenario one? You had an earlier start date. If we're doing both simultaneously, why are we waiting longer? So we're waiting on two funding streams for scenario two. One would be FEMA, and to be honest, the scenario one is a best case scenario that FEMA has funding for us in May. It is more likely that it is in the later spring, early summer. Uh, the second part is that we have to coordinate with um, our federal funding. Um, they don't start their process until next month to even start evaluating the projects that they have awarded money to and typically would not have funding available to us until fall. We're hoping to expedite their process. So we already have funds with the Wharf, Wharf Resilience Project. Why wouldn't we use, utilize those dollars while we wait to start now or sooner than summer to kick it off? There's restrictions on the federal funding that you're not allowed to commit gotcha. anything until they give you a green light. Okay. Even gotcha. if you have additional funding from other sources. Um, for the um, Wharf Resilience Sleep Project, the, the one that actually council already approved the conceptual design on, which one of the designs are we moving forward or is that gonna come back to council, the one with the bathroom or the not bathroom or which one are we talking about that you're quoting up here? With the federal funding that we uh, received in December, that would include the restroom, yes. Okay, so that was the one I think that we haven't seen come back to on a final design. Are we gonna see that? The intention was to bring it back to council prior to bidding the project. Okay, um, and then we had a, I had a request right when this all was starting to take place about a, a committee on the wharf resiliency project. Are we still gonna be moving forward? You mentioned getting input through a social media campaign or something like that, but are we actually gonna bring a committee together to give that input or are you gonna just simply do the social media and whatever it was called earlier? So we have a couple ideas and and I don't think that they're fully formed yet. So I'll kind of ad lib where we are and then we'll see and see if there's anything else we want to develop. Um, number one is around the, the fundraising campaign. So Jessica touched on, touched on the fundraising campaign concept, but real, really what that's about is, is some community members um, have expressed an interest in organizing a campaign to really help the work, to help make it really shine when it's done. And so funding a lot of these extra things, the lights, cool furniture, maybe interpretive elements, things like that. And incorporated in that concept has been some public outreach, because that's, Right, the wharf renovation project is much more engineering oriented. You know, it's about pilings and decking and things like that, that the, the enhancement project would have um, more kind of the things that I think people Right, so the $7 million project that we approved doesn't include all those shiny lights and such, and that's why you wanna do this committee or this outreach for to the community for the fundraising, is that what you're saying? That's kind of the general okay. thought, yeah. Okay, great. Um, and then the last, the last question is in regards to the, when we start working on the wharf, we've received, I've received several emails about the plaques and what's the process on plaques now and are we gonna save them and give them back or what's the process and who do our, who can the community reach out to for that? So we're still in the process of inventorying them. Actually, we've taken this effort since we've had to inventory all of them to inventory every single memorial plaque in the city I I mean, find on, the on the beach. I really did. That was my goal to find um, them. And luckily, those plaques were videoed in anticipation of our larger project. So we do have a record of everyone that was out there. Um, our development services technician salon <laughs> is heading up that project. Um, anyone can contact Public Works in Chalon directly about their particular plaque, and that same list will get information on how we're going to move forward, but so far there has not been a decision made. Okay, those are all my questions, thank you. Thank you, any other council questions? I think. Do we have any public comment? Anybody online? 
Okay. Well, we can go back to council comments, deliberation. I'll make a motion to adopt the resolution terminating the proclamation of local emergency. I'll second that motion. Great, we have a first and a second. Um, I just wanna say I do really like the idea of having the visual timeline um, at, the be at the beginning of the wharf. Um, just, I think um, throughout this process, as much transparency as we can give in, in, in not tying our names to any direct dates or anything, but um, I know the public is really wanting to know a lot about this project, so I appreciate our efforts getting getting ahead of it. And so, yeah, I think a timeline would be really cool. Um, and we can have a roll call. Aye. 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 That's unanimous. We can move on to 9B, which is the design contract for the community center and the renovation project. It's also for you, Jessica. Yes. Sorry, give me just a no worries. The presentation. There we go. All right, good evening again, Mayor and Council members. Um, I am pleased to bring forward the design contract for the Community Center Renovation Project. As you all know, the Community Center is a public facility operated and maintained by the city under a long-term use, uh, long use agreement with the so-called Union Elementary School District. Uh, the building and grounds was um, constructed in, 19, in the 1980s, and during the fiscal year 22-23 budget development, Council allocated $150,000 to kick off the uh, design of this project. Um, per the agreement, uh, the city is required to complete cer certain infrastructure and ancillary improvements to the community center building um, within four years of the agreement date of November 2022. As you can see, this basically touches every surface of the community center, so it is quite an extensive project. Um, in addition to our uh, require, contractual requirements, there are also additional opportunities to improve the acoustics of the building. Um, it's divided into three spaces, but you can definitely hear stuff in space C and space A. <laughs> and um, additional opportunities to really connect the park area with the building, which is somewhat limited in some spaces right now. Um, the total construction costs of these improvements is estimated to be about 1.7 million. Uh, staff released an RFP in November and included um, information really about the importance of stake, uh, uh, stakeholder input in the conceptual design of the project and also coordination with the design of the accessible park next door, which council awarded a design um, contract for to Verde Design uh, last meeting. Uh, a selection panel consisting of public works and recreation staff evaluated and ranked all the proposals uh, with the evaluation criteria included in the RFP, and three firms are interviewed at the end of January, and we are recommending Boone Low Ratliff Architects for award this evening. Boone Low Ratliff Architects is a local woman-owned Santa Cruz firm that has led multiple successful remodel projects for public infrastructure in Santa Cruz County including the Live Oak Resource Center, which is the large image uh, on your left there, um, the Homeless Services Center on the right, and then also specializes in outdoor learning spaces like the one there on the bottom left. Um, here is our estimated project schedule. We are at consultant selection this evening. Um, we anticipate having a shovel-ready project by the end of the calendar year, and based on budget, upcoming budget discussions, it is possible to have construction started on this building as soon as fall of 2023. Uh, so the recommendation is to award this design contract an amount not to exceed approximately $150,000, and I am happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you. Do we have any council questions? <laughs> I have 15 questions for you. <laughs> All right, I'm no. going up every time. <laughs> no, my question's just about the final timeline. You, I saw summer up there of 24, and we have our wonderful summer programs. Are you writing that into the, to the, with, to this, that we're hoping to get that done sooner, or what's the approach there? We, and 
we would time it so that we have the least amount of impact to the summer programs. I know those programs and all the programs in the community center are really valuable to the community. Um, so it would definitely be timed in a way or find a situation with the recreation department so those programs could still go with minimal disruption. Perfect, thank you. That's great. Okay, any public comments? Anybody online? Okay, great. We can come back to council for deliberation. All I'd like to say is that it's been a long time coming. It's been glad to see it get done. I know mm -hmm. that park is well used by many, many folks, not just Capitola, but throughout the county. So that would be great. Yes. Just fighting. <laughs> I'll make a motion to authorize the city manager to execute a professional services agreement with Boone, Lowe, Radcliffe, Architects in the amount of not to exceed $149,713 for the design of the remodel of the community center in substantially similar form as approved by the city attorney as the attached agreement. I'll second. <laughs> That's a good one. First and <laughs> second. If we have a roll call, please. Aye. 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 Thank you. Passes unanimous. We can go on to 9C, which is the <laughs> environmentally sensitive habitat area riparian vegetation planting reimbursement program. I'm once again, turning the floor over. <laughs> Last but not least, for me. <laughs> All right. So in an effort to incentivize and promote sustainable development, water conservation, and stormwater pollution prevention, the Commission on the Environment has developed and recommended for approval the, atta the attached Environmentally Sensitive Habitat Area, or ASHA, Riparian Vegetation Planting Reimbursement Program, or program. Um, for those of you who may not be aware, a riparian area is an area that uh, is a vegetated area found between aquatic and terrestrial habitats. Uh, benefits of planting in riparian areas include stabilizing stream banks, providing corridors for wildlife, improving water quality, and slowing floodwaters. Um, the program, um, as proposed, is a reimbursement program of up to $300 per eligible parcel for plant materials. So these are parcels immediately adjacent to the ESHA of the so-called Creek and Noble Gulch riparian watersheds. Um, an applicant would have to be uh, authorized to implement the project, so either the owner or authorized by the owner to put, do the plantings. And the project plants must be from the provided list. Um, there's about 125 eligible parcels um, with a maximum $300 reimbursement would be a, a program about $40,000 at its maximum uh, proposed to come out of the Green Building Fund. Um, this is a map of all the city's ESHA. The two ESHA we are talking about are circled in yellow, the SoCal Creek watershed there on the left and the Noble Gulch there on the right. Um, all the plants on the plant program put together by the environmental consultant are native plant species indigenous to the so-called creek watershed, including trees, shrub, ground cover, and ferns. It's a pretty extensive list. Um, the application and reimbursement program is quite simple as formed by the Commission on the Environment. Um, it includes a pre-application where the applicant must come in, speak to someone in public works to make sure they have read and reviewed um, the project requirements and signed to it. Um, then they go out, purchase their plants, obtain permits if it's required by some other part of the project that they are completing, and then um, post installation, submit invoices and receipts. Uh, staff verifies that they meet the program criteria and they can receive reimbursement. Um, the Commission of the Environment has discussed and developed this program over several meetings, and at their last meeting on February 15th, unanimously recommended that the City Council establish this program. And I am happy to answer any questions. The last slide mentioned um, that folks would purchase the plants from the approved list and obtain permits if required. Mm -hmm. How does that, is it based on where they live? Is it based on, how, so it, it sounds like maybe some people would require permits and some wouldn't. Can you clarify what that means? If this is associated with like a building permit or some other project that they have on the books, any kind of just planting project on its own would not require a permit. Okay, so if it's just someone that just wants to do this particular project, they don't need a permit, but if they're like building a new deck and want to get reimbursement for the plants that they're going to put around it, they might need a permit for the deck. Right. Okay, that makes sense. Okay, thank you. Next question. Um, 
In regards to the eligible applicants, when I think about um, some of the units or housing along the corridor there, there's mobile homes, there's townhouse units, there's where if it, one applicant, perhaps it's the HOA or it's the, for, for such a large area, how, how would we address something like that? Or how do we make it where they can get, do they have to have every resident petition? You know, I'm just trying to think of like the easiest way to get, to get that support for. So the homeowner or the parcel owner can give permission to the HOA to apply on their behalf. So the HOA could collect all the permission from the homeowners and submit it at once. Hmm. Okay. Um, is that written into this practice as like, you know, if you are part of a HOA or part of a, I, I don't know what our, the, the townhouses or whatever it is, you know, yeah, like, mm -hmm. is that going to be written in some clear language so that they, that folks know that that's an option for them? Because I'm reading it here that it's, it says 300 per eligible applicant. And <clears> if I think of eligible applicant, that could be one property management company or one HOA. And $300 doesn't seem a lot to go through right. that. So. so it's not in there explicitly, but it can be. That is definitely an easy amendment to clarify um, HOAs being qualified to apply on the behalf of their I'm curious, am, am I missing anything? And maybe other, like if it's the terminology for HOA is, is inclusive enough to cover different types of parcels mm -hmm. or... Um, so like property management well, agency. Well, yeah. none of that language is in there as of right now. Right. So if there's anything, and maybe we can talk about, we could do this during deliberation in terms of like making sure that I include the right language if I want to amend this um, this particular action to be more inclusive. Okay. So that's all my questions. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay. Public comment. Anybody online? Okay, we can bring it back to council. I think we have some ideas about amending the language. Yeah, like do our mobile home parks have HOAs <coughs> in yeah. them? So those are covered. Um, the like, I'm just trying to think, anyone else on the corridor that's not a single family unit that wants to apply for this these kinds of funds that we're being inclusive of them. Could you just say like authorized representatives of multifamily dwellings? Like HOAs, property managers are authorized representatives? I think HOA would cover it. And here's why is that it, it's a per parcel reimbursement. Um, and so right. it has to be parcelized, right? Yep. In other words, it has to be cut up into lots. So Brookvale Terrace, for example, is a parcel. It's an eight, I think 40 parcels in Brookvale Terrace that are okay adjacent to um, and then in addition on Wharf Road up by the freeway, I think there's some other condos as well. So I think HOA. Right. I guess my concern is that not everyone that lives in these multi, that are, not everyone that lives there are owners. And so to get every single owner, you know, to get their signature approval to then give to the property management, that might be really cumbersome. And so I'm wondering if there's a way for us to say a, an entity and an, a property management as a whole can access these funds up to the amount of parcels that they have um, in their But then wouldn't that cause overlap if like the, the homeowner themselves was also gonna go like say unit 40 or whatever went wants 300 and, and then the and whole then HOA wants the, the amount for everybody yeah I don't, I don't know. know. I don't know. Maybe then the burden would be the burden should be on the HOA to get approval from each of the units. You know what I mean? Yeah. Rather than the other way around. Sorry, I missed that. Like if 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 it would be, it would seems like it would be overly burdensome to ask each of those uh, renters if it's a renter right or someone in in an HOA to go get approval from their HOA to do this, but. The other way around seems to make sense, right? Like if you're an HOA and you want to get a $300 reimbursement for 300 units, that essentially you need to go to each of those 300 units and say, do you want to claim this or can I claim it for you? Yeah, yeah right. Because typically in an HOA, you are, you have to be granted permission by the HOA to do any type of like, oh, that's a good point. You know, yeah. so 
I don't I don't know if we're yeah. like splitting hairs or if yeah I'm, I, I'm now I'm more confused I I think too when we were discussing it um, at the environment meeting it was we also did sort of leave it open-ended as far as seeing how the program takes off and kind of seeing how much traction we gained and then because we we had thought about putting like a cap on um god like if they could come back and ask for more money if they like the next year or something like that and we didn't really do that so that we could see what kind of action we got from the program itself so yeah i think my intent what i would hope for is the maximize opportunity the ma the the most <clears throat> maximized opportunity for restoration along the corridor and especially with folks in hoas that that would be impossible if it was one at a time because like even my i i hate always bring like to bring myself into it but the it, you know i'm off of the actual creek and mm -hmm. so i wouldn't do that and nor you know but that eliminates that opportunity for restoration to take place so i'm just wondering again how we can get entire hoas able to apply for as much money as possible to start that work um so maybe it is that hoas have the capability but we don't make it as challenging for them like if an entire property management said that there was 47 units or whatever i don't think that's the intent though to, i think it's to allow the individuals to go out and what this was something that actually i've been working on it was something i brought forward to the environmental commission um, so my intent was to try to maximize restoration along the creek um and not specifically for the individuals um which i i get where the balance is to come up with the individualized process but we have a lot of places along the corridor that are multi-unit um, developments and so well, okay I don't I don't want to misspeak on this item but like in so it where I live there is the part of land that is closest to the creek itself is not owned by the individual parcel owner it is owned by the HOA so the HOA wouldn't have to go to the owner for yours yeah. to do work on so that portion yeah. of the creek. So it'd be really important for us to add HOA and property management companies can access above and beyond per eligible applicant, because then in your example, you, your HOA wouldn't be able to access those dollars. Right. So I think maybe we need to figure out it depending on how many parcels available to the HOA, how much they would be allotted? My, my, my recommendation is to go, I think, with what Kristen suggested, because I think that it would be difficult to tell somebody that their HOA had spent the money because if they were eligible to receive it themselves. Right. So I think, I think just basically saying that HOAs, we can add that language, HOAs can collect the fees on behalf of their individual eligible parcels, right? Because it's not every parcel that touches the ESH. Not every parcel in Brookfield yeah. Terrace touches the ESH, only some of them do. And then also just have a specific form where they can say, and these 25 people have authorized us to collect on their behalf. I, I also, I, then I guess I would ask, I would reckon, ask for staff to create some sort of a letter, some sort of like process that HOAs and for property management companies can utilize to then send out to all property owners to say, you can opt out of this, but otherwise we're gonna be <laughs> applying for funds to do this project. Um, Cause then that helps with the, you know, it's the one of those uh, trick ones where you have to opt out to opt in kind of thing. Um, but it'd be nice to have a letter that everyone can utilize and then that could work. Um, okay, so I think that I'm going to test this out no, with I legal. That created a new question. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> How are we planning to advertise this program in general? Like, are we are we sending green cards to everyone who's eligible to do this? Are we just going to put it on our website? Like, now that you mentioned, yeah, if you're going to have a letter, like, how are we planning to tell people this is an option for them? The Commission on the Environment intends on um, spearheading the public outreach for this. Okay. Yes. 
that was a conversation we intended on having at our next meeting after this was process was approved. Makes sense. Okay, thank you. Um, for Samantha, I'm looking at you. Is the best way to for terms amount to not to exceed three hundred dollars per eligible applicant? including HOAs and property management, individual applicants, how would I best phrase this to be inclusive of, of all? I, yeah, I, I think... Applicant is fine. I think you could just say, you could just move the staff recommendation, including direction given by the council during this discussion, and let staff figure out. I, I think I'll look to the public works director and the city manager to make sure that you clearly understand the council's direction. And then I think that we can wordsmith some language to be included in the policy, if that works. Mm -hmm. Cheryl, you can go ahead and unmute yourself. Thank you. Um, I'm Cheryl Colston. I'm the, H, uh, the Property Owner Association uh, president at Brookville Terrace. And um, the property along Noble Creek is owned by the park or man, it's common area, of course, and it belongs to all the, it's a resident owned park. So they all own it, but they don't have, the residents don't have, can't plant on it or do anything or, um, anyway, we have a creek committee that is doing the um, planning of, they've been working on restoring the riparian area with native plants and right now working with some erosion specialists after the storm damage. So. Um, it would not be the residents that would apply for this money. It would be the um, HOA or the Property Owners Association of Brookville. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to attempt okay. this motion. I um, move to approve staff recommendations on item C with um, direction given tonight by council. I'll second. Great, we have a motion and a second. May we also have a roll call, please? Aye. 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 Thank you, passes unanimous. We can move on to 90. These are the city council appointments to city advisory bodies. I believe this will be Julia. Oh, this is our disco party. <laughs> Did it stop doing it? Good job, Julia. Chloe walked away and everything just. I don't have a microphone, so I just think I'm going to have to ask you to turn. ran away. <laughs> we, we could find another option. one, you know. <laughs> Good evening, Mayor and Council Members, and I am before you tonight once again to make appointments to advisory bodies for both county multi-jurisdictional bodies and city advisory bodies. So the recommendation tonight is that the City Council review and update City Council appointments as representation for the City of Capitola on county and multi-jurisdictional boards and commissions. The commissions tonight that are being reviewed are the Santa Cruz County Children's Network Jurisdictional Committee and the Santa Cruz County Metro alternate appointment and just the alternate appointment for this body. In addition, staff recommends making appointments of members to the public to the city's advisory bodies for the Arts and Culture at Commission as an at-large position and then the Finance Advisory Committee as a business representative position. As a reminder, the city of Capitola is represented on various multi-jurisdictional advisory bodies by members of the city council. These boards and committees are established by other codes or bylaws. For tonight, we are reviewing the Santa Cruz County Children's Network Cabinet. This cabinet's bylaws do not require an alternate, but it has been a while since we have reviewed this um, appointment. So the current representation is Councilmember Brooks and there is no alternate assigned. 
And then for Santa Cruz County Metro, the current um, representative is Vice Mayor Brown and the alternate was former council member Bertrand and that per alternate position needs to be updated. So at this time I'll pause for deliberation and allow you guys to take a look and review these appointments. I'm happy to be the alternate for Metro. Anybody else wants it? I was gonna say, put my name in the hat there too, but either way, either yeah. way I'm fine either. I'm currently the chair for Children's Network, so whoever wants it would have to stay there. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm happy to stay on, but um, every other member does currently have an alternate. I attend them all since I'm the chair currently this year. It would be nice to just have an alternate because everyone else has one, um, but I plan to be at all of them. So I'm happy to keep it if no one else wants it as chair, and then I would love an alternate role. I think you should definitely keep it, um, but I can be your alternate. Okay, thanks. Well, if, if you would like to take the Metro, I would be glad to help out. I have lots of kids and grandkids, so. Or, okay. I if, don't have any affiliation with children. Or same, <laughs> same. <laughs> I would be more interested in the Metro. <laughs> I, <laughs> well, that's, that's how I was feeling. I just didn't say it. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> so I'm putting it up on the screen here. So the current um, primary appointment for the Children's Network Cabinet would be, would continue to be Council Member Books and then Council Member Clark would be the alternate. Great. And then I did not get, I think apologize. Okay. Alexander, without the kids, no. <laughs> So is there a motion on the table to make the appointments that are listed up on the screen? Move to make a motion. I think, um, do we need to public comment that? Should we wait, wait, can we do all the advisory bodies and then go to public comment? Or do oh, we need oh, to, oh, okay. oh, there's oh. more? Yeah, there's, well, we have the commission. Wait, there's yeah, we have more. The, the commissions. Okay, um, um, so we have that, and then we can go to the second part of this item. Correct, so as a reminder, the city has established multiple advisory bodies. These bodies assist and advise in formulating policy. Appointments are made depending on bylaws or municipal code. For the two bodies that are up before you tonight for consideration, um, I received two applications from members of the public. For the Arts and Cultural Commission, there is currently one regular vacancy, and for the Finance Advisory Committee, there are currently um, two vacancies, however, the bylaws of the BAC allow for one or two business representatives to be on the commission. So we really only need one appointment. We have one applicant currently listed. The current composition of the Arts and Cultural Commission has one vacancy and we've received one application. Her name is Laura Orantes and she has been found to meet the requirements. Um, the Arts and Cultural Commission did meet and review this applicant and recommended that the City Council make an appointment of Laura Arantis to a term ending in 2024. So since I did not have an appointment and I was at that meeting, I would like to appoint uh, Laura Arantis. I don't know what to vote on it. So this appointment does require a vote of the City Council. Okay. okay. Yeah, no. okay. So Council Member Clark is the representative um, of the City Council to this committee. And moving on to the FAC, so currently, like I said, there are two vacancies for business representation on the FAC. Um, the bylaws of the FAC allow for one or two business representatives. We've currently received one application from a business representative in the community, Michael Levine. He's been found to meet the requirements and he's a new applicant. So staff recommends that as per the bylaws, there can be one or two business recommend, or representatives on this committee. So staff would recommend making one um, appointment. Great, any questions? Any public comment on both parts of this? Anybody online? There are no hands raised on Zoom. Great, we can go to deliberation. Uh, I will uh, share at least about the appointment for Laura Arantes. She's a neighbor of mine. I know she's really excited to be a part of the Art and Cultural Commission. I think she'll be a good fit. Uh, and I welcome uh, Mr. Levine, is that it? Yes, mm -hmm. uh, to the 
uh, Finance Advisory Committee. It's lots of fun. Uh, and I'll make a recommendation that we accept all of the uh, appointments to the committees and advisory bodies that were listed tonight. I'll second. Great. Perfect. Um, so with that, Councilmember Brooks? Aye. Councilmember Clark? Aye. Uh, Councilmember Peterson? Aye. And Vice Mayor Brown? Aye. And Mayor Kaiser? Aye. Great, welcome aboard to the city. Okay, let me make sure I'm not missing anything here. I've done that before. Okay, it looks like we're at item 10, which is meeting adjournment. Thank you very much. Have a lovely evening. Stay warm and dry, because it doesn't sound very pretty out there. So, good night. Woo, Ooh, that was a loud one. <laughs>